Hello, I'm JJ Joaquin, and welcome to Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Today, we will explore cross-cultural philosophy. Now, philosophical questions and insights are often thought of as universal and culturally invariant. What European philosophers have thought about are something that philosophers from Asia and Africa have also thought about. Now, recent work in cross-cultural philosophy, however, suggests that philosophy is more culturally nuanced than that. Now, to discuss cross-cultural philosophy and why it matters, we have Masaharu Mizumoto, Associate Professor of Philosophy at the School of Knowledge and Sciences in the Japan Advanced Institute for Science and Technology, and the co-editor of Epistemology for the Rest of the World. Hello, Masa. Welcome to Philosophy and What Matters. Hello. Okay, so before we get into our main topic, let's first discuss your philosophical background. How did you get into philosophy? Yes, I actually, I, my, as, an, as an undergraduate, uh, my department was not a philosophy, uh, philosophy department, and there was no philosophy department in the you know, university. And therefore, I studied philosophy all by myself. Uh, of course, there were some uh, uh, professors doing continental philosophies, but uh, I didn't know anything about analytic philosophy. So I, yes, I started uh, studying analytic philosophy all by myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so, but uh, where did you study? Sorry, when? Where did you study? Uh, in my university, uh, in Hitotsubashi University. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I went to the uh, uh, master and doctoral courses in that university. Mm -hmm. Therefore, uh, yes, even in graduate, uh, graduate school, I was not uh, really, uh, got any uh, formal training in philosophy. Uh, oh, so, I, yeah. so what's your course in, in the academe? You're not in a, the philosophy program. So what's your main course? Uh, it's called uh, social science. Social science. So it's a general yeah. social, social science yes, course. Very general, yes, social <laughs> science. So, uh, so I just focused on my own research and mm -hmm. uh, do it by myself. <laughs> so how did you get into analytic philosophy? Yeah, so I knew uh, Wittgenstein when I was undergraduate. So I was very, yes, interested in uh, Wittgenstein's philosophy. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was the, yes, uh, beginning of my uh, yes, uh, interest in philosophy. Mm -hmm. So you started with Wittgenstein. Yes. But, yeah, but who influenced you to pursue a career in academic philosophy? When, sorry, when? Who influenced you to pursue a career in academic who? philosophy? Who? Oh, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, because I, I was just, yes, uh, wanted to yeah, do, uh, continue my uh, study of Wittgenstein's philosophy. And therefore maybe uh, that's Wittgenstein. <laughs> so influenced Witt me, yeah. Wittgenstein, so sp specifically the Tractatus or the philosophical investigations that can- uh, Basically, uh, in general, uh, philosoph uh, Wittgenstein's philosophy. So uh, both early and later Wittgenstein. Mm, okay, so yeah. we have that in common because I'm also interested in Wittgenstein's work. Uh -huh. <laughs> that, that also led me to philosophy. Yeah. Okay, so most of your work focuses on cross-cultural philosophy. Could you give us a description of what cult cross-cultural philosophy is, its main goal and its methods of to arrive at that goal? I uh, actually don't know about uh, whether there is <laughs> whether there is such a top uh, such a uh, genre of philosophy as cross-cultural philosophy, but I'm, 
And mainly what I am doing is uh, now is uh, cross linguistic studies in philosophy. And therefore, maybe if cross linguistic uh, investigation is also cross cultural, then uh, that's maybe also cross cultural philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, I have been more interested in concepts people have. Mm -hmm. So even if you have uh, some very uh, diverse uh, cultural, cultural diversity, uh, it's not clear how uh, that diversity is related to philosophy. So of course, moral judgments would be very interesting topic if there is such a cultural diversity. But uh, uh, when we talk about, uh, because we are mostly interested in concepts, uh, philosophical concepts. So uh, we need to, yes, we need, we need the, uh, some difference in normativity. And uh, in order to have such uh, difference in normativity, uh, we at least have such, uh, yes, uh, maybe linguistic uh, differences because uh, uh, at the least we have uh, linguistic norm, norms. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. so yes, it will be uh, easier to talk about the uh, such uh, conceptual difference when we, uh, yes, investigate the cross-linguistic issues. Okay, so you're, you're talking about cross-linguistic analysis of certain philosophical concepts. Yes. So could you give us an example? You talked about uh, moral concepts like good or bad. Yeah. So are there nuances, cultural nuances or linguistic nuances in using those concepts? Yeah. So, uh, for example, uh, intentional action. I have uh, studied uh, some uh, uh, cross linguistic studies of uh, uh, noble effect. Mm -hmm. So, uh, there, I I did find some uh, linguistic differences, and so that's one topic. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's also related to morality, moral mm -hmm. valence. So uh, yes, that may be yes uh, of one uh, aspect of uh, yes uh, cross linguistic philosophy. But uh, the typical one is the concept of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So I have studied uh, uh, concepts of uh, knowledge or knowledge verbs, uh, the uses of knowledge verbs in Japanese and English. And uh, also uh, the concept of knowledge how. So knowledge how attributions. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, in fact, there is a, a radical difference between uh, English and Japanese uh, in uh, knowledge how attribution. Okay, so let's yeah. go back a bit to your idea of normativity and linguistic structure. Yeah. So yeah. What, what does what does that entail? What do you mean by linguistic normativity in this in this particular? Yeah, because every language have uh, every language is governed by linguistic norms. Mm -hmm. Therefore, uh, because concepts is normative, con uh, normative concept. <laughs> concept in general is, yes, normative. Therefore, normative, that, that they have rules, that they obey rules, structural rules in language. Is that the main idea? Yeah, yes. So uh, we, uh, the concepts we use are often governed by uh, the words we use. Mm -hmm. uh, norms of uh, link, governed by uh, linguistic norms mm -hmm. uh, of words we use. 
So, for example, in Japanese, you have linguistic norms for knowledge, knowledge yeah. concepts, and knowledge, knowing yeah. how concepts. Yes. And English has a different set of norms as well. Is that yeah. uh, the idea? Yeah. And you're, you're trying to see what is the difference between those norms and how it leads to some kind of philosophical Yeah, insight. so we can't, we can't so easily say the difference of norms, but uh, uh, be, because uh, we basically, uh, most cases we find are uh, uh, differences in uh very difficult uh borderline cases mm -hmm. and therefore uh it's difficult to say that's uh uh they are uh for example they are following linguistic norms but still uh there are if there are such radical differences radical linguistic differences then we may say they have different concepts. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yes. So, so what's going on there? So you have some methods in determining this one. So do you use experimental methods? Yeah. So I'm basically just doing, uh, just uh, doing surveys using, uh, for example, uh, two temp cases, mm -hmm. and for example, uh, Gettier cases, such uh, standard using such standard cases and uh, asking ordinary people uh, to judge whether that agent knows or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're using experimental philosophy, x phi. Yes, experimental <laughs> philosophy, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, that's interesting. So in your co-edited book, Epistemology for the Rest of the World, a book yeah. you co-edited with Stephen Stitch, the founder, quote and unquote, of experimental philosophy, and Eric McCready, which was published in 2018, it's rather an intriguing book. So since it's, its aim is to let non-native Anglophone philosophers from different parts of the world to speak about epistemic concepts. But what inspired you to work on this project? Basically, uh, uh, I have been doing experimental philosophy first. So, uh, but I bet I met uh, Stephen Stitch. So, uh, basically, the idea was uh, Steve's, uh, Stephen Stitch's. Uh, Stephen Stitch suggested to hold the conference. And so, I uh, organized and held the conference, uh, Epistemology for the Rest of the World, uh, with Stephen Stitch and others. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, it's, a, it's, it's a conference in early 2000s, I, I heard, or sorry, early yes. 2010s. I was supposed to be there. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so w what were the findings of the, the project? I think the findings, there is no single findings, but uh, mm. uh, I think this is uh, uh, posing uh, problems for uh, epistemologists in general in mm. the world, uh, whether in Anglophone philosophy or uh, rest of the world, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is specific uh, traditional epistemological problems are at stake here in this uh, project? Yeah, so whether, uh, whether the concept of uh, knowledge is universal or not, mm -hmm. that's the main, main issue here. And uh, I presented many examples that count against such uh, assumption of the universality. But some other uh, contributors argued for the universality. Mm -hmm. OK, so I, I'm interested in the debate here. So there's a kind of universalist about philosophical concepts or epistemic yeah. concepts. And you yes. have the culturally pluralist uh, idea of yeah. epistemic concepts. Yes. So where are you heading there in that debate? 
because um, I presented uh, the radical difference of uses within Japanese. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the interlinguistic uh, diversity. Mm -hmm. So uh, in Japanese, there are two knowledge verbs for propositional knowledge. That is shiteiru uh, and wakateiru. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they are used very differently when uh, in, for example, in the cases of uh, that uh, two temp case and uh, what I called uh, name case where uh, the agent forgot about the name, but uh, yes, and cannot recall someone's name, but still uh, Japanese uh, uh, attributed knowledge to uh, that person mm -hmm. with shiteiru, uh, but not wakateiru. So and what's the therefore, difference? Uh, what's the difference between shiteiru and wakata? Well, what's the other one? Wakateiru. Uh, wakateiru. Wakate so yeah, so they are both knowledge verbs, mm -hmm. but uh, usually in in its basic form, wakateiru is used. Uh, its basic form of wakateiru is wakaru and which means basically understanding. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a derivative derived, derived from the word for understanding. Understanding. But, yeah, but it's when, when used for expressing propositional content, then that can be uh, usually uh, interchangeable with uh, freely, yes, uh, interchangeable with shiteiru. Shiteiru is something like knowledge in the anglophone sense. Yeah, so you can translate English you know into mm -hmm. both shiteiru and wakateiru. Mm -hmm. As long as it is used for expressing propositional knowledge. Mm -hmm. Therefore, uh, there is almost no difference in such context between these two verbs. Okay. But still in some epistemologically interesting cases, the uses are, the use diverge. Mm -hmm. So that's very interesting point. Well, that's an interesting point really, because uh, in your case, you're saying that if you have forgotten the name of someone, you still yeah. have some understanding yeah, but, I, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> but according to your findings, uh, is no, that not, not understanding, but uh, so they attributed Japanese attributed knowledge, shiteiru, to shiteiru. that person, yes. Yeah, so there's a kind of knowledge, quote in unquote, but there's no understanding. Yeah, in that case, because but the uh, pattern is opposite in the case of true temp case. Mm -hmm. What's the other case? Uh, the two temp case is where uh, the agent uh, uh, suddenly uh, got the ability to tell the temperature mm -hmm. of the of uh, of the room one is in, and therefore, uh, but he is not aware of that ability yet. So that person. The question is whether that person knows the temperature mm -hmm. or not. And Japanese, uh, most of the Japanese denied knowledge in the sense of uh, shiteiru to that person, mm -hmm. but attributed uh, wakateiru to that person. No, oh, that's interesting. So yeah. people might not know about temperature in the shiteiru sense, yes. but they understand what it means. Right. Okay, so how does it uh, affect traditional epistemic questions? Yeah, so usually if you assume one single knowledge verb, mm -hmm. you will uh, debate over whether, yeah, that person knows or not. Mm -hmm. But that debate maybe just may just depend on the concept you have 
and these different concepts are encoded in different uh, lexical items mm. in other languages. Therefore, if so, there, there would be no right or wrong in that debate. <laughs> maybe. So maybe it's just a matter of different concepts and they are both legitimate. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so that will really, I think, affect the uh, yes, debate over the nature of the debate. What epistemologists are doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. that's one consequence of pluralism, mm -hmm. yes, lexical pluralism of this thought. Yeah, that's interesting because uh, in non-English concepts like in German, they were, you have a distinction between knowing how and knowing that in German. Same as in the Philippines, we have that kind of notion as well, th that distinction. But it's only in English that that distinction is not really that fine grain. The distinction between knowing that or the propositional knowledge and knowing how or practical knowledge. Are we equating uh, what are you in, in terms of practical knowledge here? Yeah, I actually have a radical difference in uh, English and uh, in knowledge how attribution between English and Japanese. Mm -hmm. And uh, that difference occurs uh, in both ways. Uh, again, that means uh, in relation to ability, those uh, the to the agent who lacks the relevant ability, most English uh, speakers denies knowledge how, but mm -hmm. most Japanese speakers attribute knowledge how to that agent. <laughs> so there is such so there is such a case, and I had already got such a uh, result. That's so, interesting. So some some philosophers, English philosophers, English speaking philosophers are saying that, well, we could reduce knowing how to knowing that. So I think you already saw it as counter to that kind of idea. I, I'm not sure. But, uh, so that's the topic of the intellectualism and anti-intellectualism mm -hmm. and uh, whether this kind of result uh, support anti-intellectualism or support intellectualism? Mm -hmm. That would be also interesting question. And I personally, I I personally uh, think that that Japanese results, the Japanese concept of knowledge how, uh, seems to be intellectualist one. Okay. Yeah, so it's a propositional component, propositional yeah. knowledge component. Yeah, is that because that kind of knowledge can easily be reduced to propositional knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I also have had the completely opposite results. That means uh, that means to the agent who has the relevant ability, most English speakers attributed knowledge how, but most Japanese speakers denied knowledge how. Mm -hmm. okay. Again, so Japanese uh, speakers ignore the relevant ability. Mm -hmm. So there is a gap, or even there is, we may say there is no relationship between knowledge how and ability in Japanese. They're independent concepts, so to speak. Right, they are different. Okay, that's interesting. That's another interesting result. <laughs> okay, so what what's the other findings of this book, Epistemology for the Rest of the World? So you talked about the Japanese uh, concepts of knowledge. How about the other languages? Uh, because uh, Jonathan Ganley, uh, who is a philosopher of Sanskrit philosophy, uh, reported. Uh, 
in, reported the similar pluralism about the uh, knowledge verbs mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Sanskrit philosophy. And therefore, uh, yes, that's the same. Uh, maybe the, the same the same kind of interlinguistic diversity of knowledge verbs. And, uh, but still, uh, linguist uh, Anna Wierzbicka, who is the uh, founder of the NSM approach, natural uh, semantic, me semantic meta language, mm. which is uh, uh, focusing on the uh, lexical semantics about uh, around the world languages uh, of around the uh, uh, natural language in general, and therefore uh, she uh, she uh, argued for the uh, the existence of semantic prime of no. Uh, mm -hmm. Semantic prime is the concept which cannot be reduced to other concepts, and therefore, uh, no is a semantic universal mm -hmm. uh, that can be found in all the languages. And basically, what she says seems to be uh, arguing uh, for uh, monism mm -hmm. about the concept of knowledge. Yeah, I, I'm familiar with Anna Wiesvicker's work. Yeah. <laughs> She's a but, monist, a universalist about certain concepts like knowledge concepts, indexicals as well. Yes. That's interesting. And, yeah. But what, what's the argument for a, that kind of monism? I think that this kind of monism, for example, also John Turi argued for uh, the human uh, universality of the concept of uh, knowledge. Uh, that's a uh, much more uh, uh, evolutionary approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of concept, uh, universal concepts, is maybe compatible with my uh, pluralism. Mm -hmm. Because the, uh, there may be such a core concept and uh, but the problem is that because that's a small core, uh, the core itself is very thin. But the concept of knowledge we, we have, ordinary concepts of knowledge captured in ordinary languages are much more thick mm -hmm. in a sense. Epistemologists are more interested in uh, such uh, uh, very subtle uh, details of mm. the concepts of knowledge, and therefore uh, the core, the common core of the concept of knowledge, is not it by itself. It's not so epistemologically interesting. <laughs> Yeah, of course, the existence of such a core may be very significant, but almost for almost all epistemologists, uh, they are concerned with much more thick concepts of knowledge. I like the idea of thick concepts here because here the normativity comes in. Are you using yeah. thick concepts in Bernard Williams' sense that you have some norm norms present in the concept? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So where do you think is cross-cultural philosophy or linguistic heading? Uh, yeah, I think there will be a very fruitful collaboration with uh, between uh, philosophers and uh, linguists mm -hmm. and also anthropologists and uh, we will be doing such uh, yes collaborative uh, work uh, yeah, in future, uh, which will be very fruitful and mm -hmm. which will be very uh, uh, yes, uh, which which will be uh, focusing on very specific uh, aspect of uh, 
concepts, uh, philosophical, philosophically interesting concepts. Mm -hmm. So yes. this one will be a kind of interdisciplinary work. In yes, the, yes. More would... interdisciplinary than what's, yeah. what's happening right now. Yeah. <laughs> And also, why I what I am thinking is that uh, there will be even uh, uh, relevance to uh, artificial intelligence because, uh, for example, neural machine translation is now uh, developing very uh, fast, and uh, the quality is sometimes uh, uh, amazing. Mm -hmm. But uh, because if, for example, given the uh, radical differences between uh, radical differences in knowledge how attribution between Japanese and uh, uh, English, so you you translate the English sentence, knowledge how sentence uh, in particular context mm -hmm. into Japanese, then uh, the truth values of that uh, sent of these sentences would be different. Mm. And how can you, yeah, admit it as a uh, correct translation if truth values are different? No, yeah, that's interesting. I'm thinking about its application in Google Translate. Yeah. Google Translate and uh, do you know DeepL, which yeah. is a yeah, German based uh, yes, translation, um, a, uh, yes, uh, yes, machine, yes. Yeah, machine learning as well and date, big data, of course. Yeah. So, but uh, also uh, the cross linguistic diversity uh, poses. Uh, such uh, specific uh, problems like the, uh, the notion of truth and the proposition and the relation between them and also the notion of uh, equivalence of meaning mm -hmm. and uh, of course the notion of translation. Yeah, so those are really interesting stuff in philosophy of language as well. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you need philosophers, especially uh, tuned with cross-cultural linguistics to work on this. Yeah. Um, on a more personal note, what's your advice for those who want to get into professional academic philosophy? Yeah, so uh, I think that's a very difficult problem, uh, <laughs> given that if, given the uh, shrinking posts of philosophy, uh, professional philosophy. Uh, so uh, even now in Japan, in Japan mm -hmm. uh, there are only few philosophy departments. And so I, it's, I'm not very, uh, I'm usually reluctant to <laughs> uh, recommend uh, to pursue philosophy, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, professional philosophy. But uh, I recommend for uh, I recommend my students to do uh, some uh, experimental philosophy. Mm -hmm. Then you may find uh, some post in somewhere uh, uh, somewhere other than philosophy. You know, right, because you can do social science work, you yes, can do yes. experimental <laughs> psychology work. Yeah. Okay, but is a career in philosophy worth it? Yeah, of course, I think, yeah, I hope. And uh, yes, as, as long as you have a job. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say yeah. that your career is worth it? Yeah, I hope so. Yes, I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so on that note, thanks again. Okay, on that note, thanks again, Massa, for sharing your time with us. Yeah, and thank for you. For you guys, join me again for another episode of Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Cheers. Okay.